friends, wherever I've been, be it the North, the Caucasus, or the Far East, it has been an unforgettable experience. But if I survive this adventure, I can say that I've seen it all. And that I'm one tough son of a gun. Because this time we are really going to the farthest corner of Russia. To a place where the sun actually rises. The part where you can see American territory with your own eyes. Yes, we are going to Chukotka. And our mission here is to visit the Beringia National Park. Which is like a completely different universe. The scenery is otherworldly. Even our clothing here looks like it's for a moon landing. I think I look like some sort of chemical warrior from the future that uh, melts people with toxic stuff. But of course, in order to bring you cool footage, I've got to deal with my fear of water and spend tons of time on boats. Oh boy. But then again, we're going to be searching for real whales. And at the very least, our guides will show us Whale Alley, where they should be. And it looks like Chip and Dale have given up on Disneyland for Chukotka. We'll have an all-natural spa treatment in the middle of a lifeless stone desert. And we'll even visit a very special outhouse. Oh, sweet sure. As you can imagine, this is going to be the most epic and expensive adventure in the history of the show. Let's do this thing, baby. Today, we're where the sun rises. Yes, we're in the very easternmost part of Russia that they call Chukotka. Very few tourists make it out here, not because they don't want to come here, but because, gosh, is it difficult and a little pricey. But I'll explain all about that later. For now, let's let the adventure in Chukotka begin. <laughs> Everyone in Russia has heard of the mysterious realm of Chukotka. This autonomous okrug is so far east of Moscow that it's a stone's throw to the United States. We always think of America as being in the West, but to be honest, in terms of Alaska, um, it's to the East. This is a huge region, the seventh largest in the country, but it's the second smallest in terms of population. Only about 48,000 people live here. By comparison, tiny Sergeyev Passad, which we filmed an awesome video about, by the way, is home to 100,000 people. It is an interesting feeling to be in such a sparsely populated place. And the contrast with Moscow is striking. But I love lots of space, and not having a lot of people around. Perhaps I have found a new home. I could yammer on about Chukotka for a long time, but I want to get this show on the road, so I'll be brief here. To get from Moscow to the capital of Chukotka, Anadir, it's an 8 hour flight. It's 9 or 10 hours to get to JFK going the other way. Crazy, huh? But the thing is, we won't stay in the city for long, because the most epic visuals start much further away, in the more remote corners of the region, one of which is the village of Providenia, or in English, Providence. This tiny town is a place that will allow us to enter the Beringia National Park. After another long journey, I can just feel us going farther and farther over budget trying to film this region. Will we actually be able to fly back to Moscow? The real adventure begins immediately, because we'll have to fly to Providenia on an old Soviet AN-26. The airplane is so old, it feels like you're in a flying museum, haunted by Brezhnev's ghost. I had never flown on a prop plane before, and all I can tell you is that it is bizarre to be flying, and yet going so slow. But overall, the description, unique experience, fits most of the action we experienced in Chukotka, as we'll see next. After this long and exciting journey, it was time to check out the town and finally stop traveling, at least for a bit. Friends, this is Providenia, and that window back there is our rental apartments. So this is going to be our base of operations where we can show you all the cool stuff that's in this region. And uh, yeah, let's start showing you some cool stuff. All right. The settlement with the strange name of Providenia, which again translates as Providence, was named so by an Englishman who escaped a storm in the local bay. He felt he was saved by divine providence, or something like that. 
The actual settlement appeared during the Soviet era and developed rapidly as it was an important port and a place where military personnel were stationed. But then the Soviet Union collapsed and the settlement also began to decline quickly. Since the village is small, there's not much going on, but it is a great base for a trip to the national park. You'd be surprised, but there are stores with all the groceries you could want and housing for rent. And speaking of groceries, because of its epic level remoteness, prices in the region are high. So much so that 70% of the time we ate fish that the locals caught for us, so as to not leave all our money at the store. In fact, any day when a ship arrives is a holiday, because it means that there's fresh fruit and something else that's new, different, and potentially delicious at the store. This is the manliest parking lot in the universe. Every vehicle is four-wheel drive. <laughs> wow. But all these high food prices, but temptingly cheap Belarusian vodka and Previdenia can be endured. The most important thing is that the views around the village are quite impressive. And if you climb the low mountain nearby, then you'll realize that you definitely didn't fly all the way here for nothing. Although we haven't made it to the National Park yet, this is a truly gorgeous and mysterious place. The beauty around us was dramatic. And of course, the sunsets here are at the top of the world, and they're top tier. Let's talk about a few more things about traveling around Chukotka. The environment here is harsh, to put it lightly. There's almost no vegetation. It's Russia, but there's no trees. How is that even possible? Then again, the occasional shrub that you see around is actually a type of miniature birch tree. So I guess we are still in Russia after all. The climate is mega cold. Winter can last up to 10 months. It's a true winter wonderland. So plan your trip for July or August. In these months, the average temperature is about 10 degrees Celsius. Although, while we were here, it snowed in July. So yeah, the weather is brutal and unpredictable. So you should plan for some extra emergency days for your trip. If you don't have enough time, you may just not see anything. Or worse, get stuck in Providenia and miss your flight back to your home country via Moscow. A week to spare is fine. It's best to contact the staff of the Beringia National Park before you make your big plans. Their website is easy to find on the internet. They will tell you everything and organize any available trips. By the way, in addition to boats, they ride on a mechanical beast that is familiar to fans of this channel. A Tricol. We were lucky. Our first day had great weather, and we were able to drive to an extra spot of interest near Providenia before heading to the park. We went to explore Kivak, an abandoned Eskimo settlement on the southern coast of the Chukchi Peninsula. Guys, we almost had a near tragedy. The drone tried to end its own life somewhere down there. We had to walk all the way down there and get it. But one thing on the positive I can say is having to stop by this river it's really an amazing experience. I mean, I can't really explain it to you on camera, but the weather could not be better. The sun is out, but it's not too bright. It's warm on my back, but there's this beautiful, fresh, cold, wet air coming off the river. This is a pretty sweet location, I have to say. Uh, it's hard to imagine that like in three months, this is gonna be frozen again, uh, but for now, it is awesome. The trip to Kivak was as you might expect, very picturesque. The truck trip through all those Chukchi landscapes, mountains, rivers, sea coasts, and fog, it was all very inspiring. On the shore, you'll be greeted by this rusting giant, but this remnant is just a small part of the boat that was. I can't imagine how big this thing was in its heyday. The fog makes everything look very epic. It gives off some AAA video game vibes. The Kivak settlement itself has been very well preserved with pits for food storage made of whale bones still being in good condition. I highly doubt any of you have seen architecture made of whale bones. This place will definitely appeal to those who love history and archeology. span 
On a side note, do you know the difference between the Chukchi and the Eskimos? Of the two ethnic groups that call this place home, the Eskimos live on the coast and do sea hunting, while the Chukchi live far away from the water and raise reindeer. I guess I'd be a Chukchi with my passion towards water. Reindeer blood for breakfast sounds like the better option. Okay, check this out. This here, my friends, is the shoulder blade of a smaller whale or possibly a walrus, who knows, but someone a long time ago drilled two holes into it to turn it into a tool. So we're gonna take this to the local museum and give it to them. And uh, yeah, we're uh, a kind, efficient group of people, aren't we? Archaeology, baby. On the way back, we found something else interesting. The military had abandoned an old fighter plane in the middle of nowhere and used it for target practice. What's going on here? There's the remains of a ship on the shore. There's a shot up airplane. This place looks like Death Stranding, but with all the remnants of the Cold War and uh, giant animal bones, I'm feeling like we're in Fallout. Our extra day turned out to bear good video fruit. Did I mention that I love my job? This was friggin' awesome. But more importantly, there were no boats involved. Not a single one. Hooray! day the weather was also tolerable and of course Misha made arrangements with the head of the national park to take us by boat to a quote beautiful place just when I was thinking we could go on an adventure without the constant use of accursed boats Now I know why my loyal producers put three bottles of vodka on the kitchen table last night. So I'd wake up and agree to come out here. By boat, through storms, being splashed in the face by cold seawater. And now we're here at the end of the Providenia Bay where the little town is. It's the end of the bay and uh, it's, a, it's a great place to go fishing. But it's also a place where bears go fishing. So perhaps the bears are going to go humaning or something because they're gonna be fishing for us. Ha, huh. boat time, yay. Oh. After getting a smidge bored, I decided to look around. I mean, why not? Everything looked interesting and very different. And there were also these cute, yet possibly disease-ridden local gophers running around all over the place. Wow. They are called Yevrajki, which to be honest, sounds like the short term for a Eurasian woman. Why would they be called this? Ah, who knows. Anyways, we have plenty of kawaii cuteness thanks to the rodent infestation. You said there's something funny about the toilet, but I don't know, I don't get it. Look, there's like a post office box. I mean, that's cute. And this says it's uh, uh, serving physical persons, as in not legal entities. It's from a spare bag, probably. So let's see. And anyways, oh, sweet, sure. Well, as you've probably already noticed, this place is just gorgeous. All those infinite black mountains. Drone footage, activate. He's pulling some fish out of there. We're gonna have a real good dinner. Ooh, it's dinner time. Yeah. And now the day has come. We are loading our gear onto a tracol and going to the heart of Beringia. The national park consists of several territories, so we chose the best one for our travel journalistic purposes, the Senyavin Strait. This place is considered to be the calling card of Beringia as it has ancient Eskimo monuments and the most picturesque fjords, bird markets as they're called in Russian. And, of course, the cherished whales come through here often enough to almost guarantee that we'll get some footage of them. All right, guys, 
our true mission in Shukotka begins right now. We're gonna spend five days in the Biringia National Park. We're gonna see animals, nature, wilderness, all that good stuff that you can really only enjoy here. And guess what? It takes a lot of gear to get out there, so you've got plenty of stuff. We've got potatoes in dry form, potatoes in liquid form, if you know what I mean. So uh, we're ready to go. But anyways, one thing you might be wondering is, uh, how are we gonna get there? By boat, of course by boat. You know, maybe the parks around my native Cleveland do kind of suck, but they're all accessible by car. Everything should be accessible by car. <sighs> Yulia thinks I look like a butcher, but to be honest, I think I look like some sort of chemical warrior from the future that uh, melts people with toxic stuff. Because I haven't had to dress like this since I did the hazmat training on a reality show for the Russian army. Oh boy. That's it, now it's definitely on. In the first few minutes, I quickly realized why they gave us these hazmat suits. If in Magadan, our tiny boat had a motor of six horsepower, here we had 150. Vroom vroom, baby. The brutal winds and water splashing would not stop. And taking into account that it is rather cool here even in July, you would not last long without apocalyptic level protection. Don't worry, the park has all this stuff just waiting for you. No need to drag it all the way from a bunker outside of Moscow. To not waste time, we passed our base and immediately sailed to explore the bays of the strait. So I'll show you where we were staying later. As of this moment, it's adventure time, baby. Take a look off the sides of the boat. What a view! We're in a different universe here, friends. A truly different universe. Friends, behind me is one of the bird bazaars. You remember from a previous episode we showed you a bird bazaar? Well, here's one in Chukotka. And all those little black and white birds behind me, they actually lay rectangular eggs so they don't fall off the cliffs. That's pretty sweet. What isn't sweet for them is they're small and seagulls are big. And oh boy, do those seagulls just love to fly over, knock them off the cliff and take their eggs. Nature is brutal. Not even two hours later, and we were already deep into the animal kingdom, with no humans around besides ourselves. Awesome. Even a small seal was sunbathing. He is fat and charming, just like me. Here in the first hours, you could easily find horned puffins and Yuria birds. Since this is Russia, they should call them Yuri birds. Haha, <laughs> but whatever. Not only nature lovers will get a kick out of this. I mean, look at all these birds. I've never seen something like this before in all my life. There's also an island near the bird market where you can land, so that's what we're going to do. So guys, I don't quite know how to put this, but it's kind of a weird feeling of being on an uninhabited island. Well, there's like birds and ducks here. In fact, the ducks are weird. They hide between the rocks. When you come by them, they explode out. Scare the hell out of you. So you got birds and ducks. But otherwise, you know, we're in the Arctic and there's nothing here. And uh, I don't know why, but it kind of made me remember that uh, uh, your buddy Tim here is getting on in years. And I have to tell maybe some of our younger viewers that, you know, if I was 15 years old, again, or 14 or whatever when I was a teenager. I would have never believed that um, I could do some of the cool things we do here, travel. I've seen a lot of the world, a heck of a lot of Russia. Uh, so I just wanted to say thank you. And uh, for younger people out there, uh, I'd say hang in there. You know, when you're a teenager, especially if you're a guy, life sucks. Life gets a lot better when you get a little bit older, when you see your first few gray hairs. Uh, that's how things get good. So hang in there, guys. Especially, I mean, guys. There is a reason why we put together a trailer for each region of Russia, with nothing but glamour shots and some soft background music. As you can see, we are getting tons of footage that we want you to see. All right, friends, we are safe. We are on dry land and we are on the hunt for some local hot springs. Why? So everyone can take a bath, except for me. Why except for me? Because I only have one change of clothes, so there's kind of no point. <laughs> but anyways, I'm gonna be very ripe by the end of our trip. On the second day in the park, the weather turned bad. Everything was foggy, and we decided to explore some nearby hot springs. 
Against the background of a gray sky, mountains and fog, the streams of steam from the ground looked epic, and like everything in Chukotka, very alien. The cool thing about this place is that it is completely untouched. Man has only made a small foothold here and nothing else. Usually when a hot spring is discovered, it is quickly made into some sort of tourist attraction. But here you are in a 100% natural place, all alone or in the company of just friends. But the main thing is to not find yourself in the company of local bears. Look at how much fog is here. There's fog here. There's fog all over the hills in the sky and all around us. Unbelievable. This is the foggiest place I have ever seen. And I've been to Kaliningrad. Man, I feel like a rock star. Yes. Ah. Oh. Mm. The smell is really interesting, I have to say. Check this out. There's like a black sludge or film or corrosive coming through here, but it leaves a white stain on the rocks. I have never seen that. The bottom of this river is like two centimeters away. It is absolutely black. That is cool. So anyways, guys, just, just so you know, between uh, the two producers and me, there's always someone fighting to do something that they just want to do just for fun. Uh, today, uh, Misha and Yuli have won out. Uh, there's going to be some vodka waiting for them when we get back to the camp. Oh boy, it's going to be it's going to be amazing. Now the vodka part, that's more my speed. So there you go. Now this, my friends, is true Russian innovation. These pipes take the water that comes from the actual springs and direct it over here. And so when you want more hot water, because this is extremely boiling hot, you just move this over, and you get more hot water. Wow. Guys, it looks like Maxime's found dinner. Oh boy. Nom 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 nom. Yeah. Let me know in the comments if you guys do mushroom hunting where you come from. Ooh, baby. Oh yeah. Good stuff. Day 205 has passed. We haven't found any whales yet, and something tells me there'll be lots of boating tomorrow to make sure that we do. The water's particularly low, so looks like we're going to have to have a little change of plans here and wait for the boat on the other side. All right, push and push and push. Day three. The weather is certainly not ideal today either, but it's the middle of the expedition and we haven't seen a single whale. We need to fix that ASAP. I expect to see whales and maybe a walrus or something, but no, nothing, nothing but birds. This has turned into a massive bird watching tour. And you know who I blame? Not nature, but producer Misha. Misha, if you're listening, you know, I could have seen birds walking out of the front door of my house in Chekhov. While there are no whales in sight, we stop to see perhaps the most famous landmark of Chukotka, or at least what's left of it. You've probably seen this place or something similar in some movie. This, my friends, is Whale Bone Alley, which is an ancient abandoned settlement where a few hundred years ago, they started to just put big rib bones, backbones, and skulls from whales all over the place. And I can tell you one thing, whales have really big heads. Unfortunately, there's not much left of Whale Alley, as it is just bones stuck in the ground for all eternity. But even with what's left, you can appreciate the scale of this site when it was in operation. Just think, the whole zone is filled with the jaws and skulls of over 50 bowhead whales. 
And these are the huge type. Each whale weighs 100 metric tons. But how the heck did they get those titanic bodies to shore? That's the mystery. Maybe it was the same aliens who helped so much with them the our pyramids. Well, they brought them to shore somehow, and just a single skull of a bowhead whale weighs 500 to 600 kilograms by itself. And the jaws are five meters long. This begs the next question. How can you build something out of that without special equipment? It's not like whale bones are shaped perfectly like two by fours from the lumber depot. Anyways, 500 years ago, people here were able to do all this somehow and create for themselves something like a sanctuary or maybe a hunting base, outdoor theater, or maybe even a sports arena. Scientists still do not understand the purpose of this place, as there is nothing else like it anywhere in the Arctic. Okay, friends, after three solid days at sea, we finally done it. There's a whale over there somewhere. We've got the drone, and our chum is working on it right now. Everyone is a very intensely watching his little tiny monitor there to see if we're gonna get any footage. I hope we do. When we were sure that the whale was actually nearby, we jumped on the boat to see it closer. Imagine you are rushing on the boat. The engine is roaring. Then the driver turns it off. You find yourself in complete silence, and suddenly, suddenly, a huge whale's back emerges from under the water. And after a few breaths, it waves its tail, and you try to keep up with it again to get a closer look. The chase is on. We are going to get that whale footage or wind up like Captain Ahab. Friends, all the money we spent and all the time we've invested has paid off. We got them. All right, we got a whale in this video. Thank goodness. <laughs> so our main goal was accomplished. We got damn whales good, boy. But the crew was not satisfied with the shots because of the gray weather. And they also felt that the whale in question was being too shy. Well, if they want to spend another entire day on the boat, that's their right to do so. But I ain't going. <laughs> Full of vigor, my restless colleagues again jumped on that unbearable boat and rode away towards the horizon. And I was left to enjoy the sun at the base. So let's take a look around the base and I'll show you how we've been surviving in total isolation from the world. My friends, this is paradise for weirdo loners like myself. There's not a soul around for tens of kilometers, but at the same time, the accommodations are pretty sweet. Anyone can spend a week here, no problem. Unless you are truly addicted to the internet, because there ain't no signal out here. And don't we all need a break from the internet anyways? Look at all the natural beauty around us. And we have plenty of firewood and canned beef. There's even toilet paper. What could be better? Now friends, how do you build your sort of tourist hut and ranger station when there's absolutely no trees or supplies anywhere near here? You put 20 foot containers on sleds. Yeah, if you look at these, they're on like these custom sleds, and you can, I guess, attach them to, I would assume, snowmobiles in winter when the ice is frozen, and they just sort of roll over the ice. I should say slide over the ice would be the proper term. Unbelievable. What a great idea. Guys, let me show you our accommodations here. So, we go into this tourist hut, as I like to call it, and you got a little place to wash up here. This room is a little bit cooler, so you get to uh, keep your food down there and vodka. Uh, anyways, and if you go into the inner sanctum, as it were, you got a little mini, I don't know, gas stove here, and then a traditional sort of metal stove where you can throw your wood in there, burn it and stay warm, and you have all these nice places to sleep with these nice squishy mats, which are really nice, by the way. Uh, and you got a place up there. There's a whole loft zone for certain people. Yulia likes it up there, I guess, to avoid us. But so anyways, this is a pretty sweet deal, but there's one problem, guys. Your buddy Tim snores like a chainsaw. So let's go uh, hit the fast forward button and I'll show you where I stay. So this, my friends, is Tim's spot because no one can stand my snoring. So I'm over here. At least they gave me this thing to sort of lay on. It is also nice and squishy, but I definitely feel alone and cold and a little bit like a loser. Thanks, Yulia and Misha. Thank you for being so intolerant.
Meanwhile, the camera crew continued to sail the seas, but it was starting to get late. Time to go back to base, lads. It's already now 8 p.m., and they're not back. Uh, I'm starting to actually get a little bit concerned, maybe not super concerned. Uh, I do know that Misha's hardcore, and he likes to make people uh, work hardcore, but uh, it's been a long time. I think that they're now at about the, I don't know, they left at what, 10, 9, 10 a.m.? Uh, so 10 and 8 hours, that's 10 hours at sea. And that's a rough, cold sea. Guys, I don't know. Whales can uh, knock people off their boats and kill them. Uh, the water here is extremely cold. You have about five minutes to get out of the water uh, before you meet your end. And uh, that's really hard to do when you're in the middle of the water. So all I can say is I'm very thankful that there is a backup boat over there that has a pretty decent engine. And I believe it's full, but even still, we've got about 60 liters of fuel left. So if worse comes to worse, um, I'll take the cook lady and myself, go on that boat and we'll go uh, back to town. And then I'll have to start uh, planning a few funerals, I guess. Oh boy. So I can understand why they want to be out there. They want to get the maximum. This is a very rare opportunity to get some really awesome footage of whales and walruses and all that. But they've been out at sea for 11 hours now, guys. I don't know what to do. Uh, I think it's still a little bit early to pick up the satellite telephone. A little bit early to call in the rescue helicopter, but um, I don't know. This is already getting really real. It's really real. I don't know what to say. The thing that I'm most worried about here, guys, is that, um, you know, <clears throat> they may be out at sea for 11 hours, which is fine. Um, but the question is, how much that time have they spent parked? Because the boat doesn't have 11 hours worth of fuel. It just doesn't. That engine burns fuel like there's no tomorrow. So their fuel, if, if they actually have been really moving a lot, they might not be coming back. They might not be coming back. 13 hours at sea. You should be disgusted with yourselves. What the fuck are you doing? Shooting the whales, hopefully with cameras and not guns. Unbelievable. You had me so worried to death that I drank an entire bottle of vodka before you came. For me, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. So what did my dauntless crewman deliver after 13 hours at sea? For starters, they found a whale again, probably the same one they found yesterday, as it was in the same spot but he wasn't particularly keen on being filmed again. And they honestly didn't get that much footage. Uh. But after that, they went to a very unusual place, a whaler's base. They showed me the footage. Looks creepy and kind of exciting at the same time, like finding a dinosaur graveyard. I realize for many, this may seem cruel, or at the very least, like a thing that should be left in the past. But I will say this, in Russia, only the indigenous peoples of Chukotka are allowed to go whaling. That is, not even every resident of the region, but the true natives, whose history and sometimes present-day survival depends on this practice. In addition, every year an international commission sets restrictive quotas for different countries in terms of whaling. For Russia, this works out to an average of 140 whales per year, which is divided among 10 communities of indigenous peoples in Chukotka. These locals and their ancestors have been whaling for hundreds or even thousands of years. And even today, this meat is their main source of food. So to take away their right to hunt whales would essentially be the death of their culture. So like it or not, extremely limited and heavily regulated whaling is here to stay. In Chukotka, anyways. But this was not enough for them. They decided to go to the distant village of Jan Rakanot. And this gut decision did not let them down because they happened to encounter a new group of whales that came to the bay at around sunset. And it seems the whales didn't mind being filmed this time. This is a sight to behold. And for dessert, Jan Rakanot, a village with a cheerful reputation, as director Misha put it, was waiting for them. They say that the locals there like to start off by getting a drinking, then getting a knife fighting. Yeehaw! It seems that my colleagues had decided to visit the Chukchi Deep South. But everything went well. 
no one attacked them. Instead, a big guy from the Orenburg region, who holds the locals back so they don't fight too much with knives, told my comrades about the merry local life that abounds and showed them the village. It turned out that new houses and a whole hospital have been built here. There is hope. And I must say, the places around these parts are very beautiful. There is even something like another whale alley. In short, life goes on. Russia moves forward, even in distant places. And it is places like this that make you realize just how huge Russia is. And here is our fifth day, the final day of the expedition. We once again went to the place where our colleagues met the whales, and our new whale friends said goodbye to us right properly. Thanks guys, and thanks to the people who work at Beringia for making this happen. It was a unique and unforgettable experience, with all those wild landscapes, endless spaces, hordes of birds, seals, whales, and of course I'll never forget our crazy yet cozy base with steaming hot springs right next door. This adventure is going to stick with me for a lifetime. And speaking of adventures, ours did not end here, because the airplanes to and from Providenia fly twice a week, so we still have a few free days until our plane comes for us. And in the event of bad weather, we have to be prepared for the plane to potentially not come at all. Locals say that once there was no plane for 42 days. <laughs> I hope they had plenty of money on their bank cards. So what is there to do in Providenia while you're waiting for your plane? Sometimes it's just too cloudy to film, so if the outdoors is not an option, then... That's right, we go indoors to the Beringia Heritage Museum. The museum is pretty basic, but at the same time very decent for such a remote place. You'd be surprised at how nice local museums can be, even in places where only 2,200 people live. Interestingly, this place turned out to be the most northeastern museum of Russia. Here you can learn everything about the history of the area some exhibits amazed me. The best example would be the tiny boat on which in ancient times people managed to catch whales. How is that even possible? Seriously, how can you possibly stop a whale on that tiny thing? And they also had a pre-industrial raincoat, which is made from the insides of seals and walruses. In short, you can see the local culture in great detail. I fully recommend it. I don't know if this comes across on camera, but the locals here used to make these kind of yurts but they actually put a yurt within the yurt. That is impressive, and that shows just how cold it is here. Who doesn't love a banner with Lenin made out of seal hides? Unbelievable. Lenin is our banner, it says. Wow. Taking a 10 minute drive from Providenia, you will get to another place where you can immerse yourself in history. Only the exhibits here are not behind glass, but literally under your feet. This is the abandoned military town of Ureliki, which was founded in 1947, when the military began being sent here to strengthen the eastern borders. There was a new Cold War to fight after all, and guess who lives next door? But after the fall of communism, there was no need for so many troops, and in 2000, the town was officially abandoned. From our rental apartment in Providenia, the main thing you could see out the window was the exact mirror image of our town, except completely devoid of life, rotting away before our eyes. I wonder what the psychological effect of this view has on the locals. For me, constantly seeing Ureliki was darker than even the most evil thoughts on a 90s Norwegian black metal album. Guys, although uh, taking a tour of a building that's falling down is maybe not the safest thing you could do, uh, it's definitely interesting to see the Soviet past and these uh, abandoned uh, military cities that uh, still look pretty good. And this building actually might be savable. Well, except for the electricity. The electricity's about done. And our last location was another ancient Eskimo settlement, Avon. 
As always, beautiful, otherworldly, and interesting. In fact, we have already seen so much here in Shukotka that we were kind of mentally running on fumes. So let's admire the local beauty for the last time, while I give out some more useful information for you. To visit the National Park, you have to file for a border pass on the Gosuslugi website. This will allow you to visit the nearby islands, as they are considered a border area. Despite the fact that I am a Russian citizen, when I came to Providenia, I had a 90 minute long chit chat with the border patrol about what I'm doing here, thanks to my place of birth being Cleveland, Ohio. So nothing serious, but expect an uh, interrogation delay. But how can we leave Chukotka without seeing the capital, Anadir? First of all, the airport here is located on the other side of the bay, and there is no bridge. Why did they build the airport across the gigantic bay from the city? It was glorious vision of great communist party of Lenin! So what did we do? First we took a cab to the ship, which doesn't go very often, then you float across the bay for what seems like an eternity, and then you grab a cab to your hotel or in our case, a rental apartment. I haven't seen anything like that. The town itself is quite nice and well kept, with lots of colorful houses, as they should be in northern latitudes, doused with snow half the year or more. I can't say there's that much to do here, but it's definitely possible to spend a day enjoying yourself waiting for a plane to Providence. But at the same time, Anadir feels detached from the world, but is paradoxically big enough to feel like a state capital, just a very small one. You can do the same online shopping here as you would in Moscow. So if you can order an American football delivered from China, that means you're in civilization. On the way back, we made sure not to forget to buy some caviar and fish to take home. It's excellent here. And here are all the lovely places we visited during these two weeks. Two weeks in Chukotka. I can't believe we actually made it happen. You know, I'm kind of at a loss for words as for what to say about my time in Chukotka. I mean, I could use one of my usual cliches and say it was epic or awesome, but that doesn't do the experience justice. Maybe I could say it was like being in an alternate reality, or at the very least, it was like being in Hideo Kojima's Death Stranding which I later found out was based on Iceland, whose terrain mirrors Chukotka. Many people, and me before the trip, asked me the question, why the hell go to Chukotka? It's so far away, it's so expensive, so difficult, zero comfort, plus nothing to do. But this place is a real hidden gem. I mean, it is just so different from what you're used to. And for you environmentalists out there, you see nearly zero human impact. Things are as God made them. As one of my Tim Team members put it, Chukotka offers a pleasant loneliness, which is something that appeals to me at least. At the same time, there are wonderful people living and working in Chukotka. We were very warmly welcomed at the National Park, and it was a pleasure being able to feel their passion for this region. There are people working very hard to breathe life into Russia's most forgotten region. Chukotka is worth the effort. It was a very special place and an exceptional experience. This kind of adventure is truly one of a kind. There are more people on Earth with luxury yachts than have taken a trip here. But if you are one of those lucky people who saw Chukotka with their very own eyes, then I'm sure your life was never the same again.